Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we will be looking at measures of location in section 1.3, page 24, in your notes. The textbook by Devore and Burke. First of all, in your study guides, you will find the study objectives for today. We are going to look at numerical measures of location, how to calculate and interpret that. Then we are also be looking at the sample mean and how we can write that in terms of general statistical notation. We are going to calculate the sample mean from a data set or a stem and leaf display. Then we are going to differentiate between a sample mean and a population mean, conceptually and also using the appropriate symbols. We'll also be um, looking at the sample median, how to calculate that, how it is defined, and then also differentiate between the sample median and the population median conceptually and using appropriate symbols. We're also going to show you how to choose the best measure of location in the presence of outliers when you have um, a symmetric population distribution from which you are sampling or a skewed population distribution from which you are sampling. We're going to look at interpretation of quartiles of or percentile values, also at trimmed means. Then we'll also look at um, measures for categorical data and the relation between a sample proportion and a sample mean of binary data. First of all, then, last week we looked at graphical displays as a means of describing a data set. Today we'll be looking, and this week we'll be looking at numerical summary measures, numbers that might serve to characterize the data set and convey some of its most important features. What are the most important features that we mentioned last week? Location, range or spread and shape of the distribution, the frequency distribution that we looked at. Where was, we said, where is the frequency distribution or the histogram located or centered? How wide is it spread? And what's the general shape of the histogram? But now we need numerical measures to describe those aspects. And the first thing is the so-called mean just a notation. From now on, we're going to indicate a sample values with x1 to xn. The n referring to the size of the sample and the sample mean then we're going to indicate by, it, by an x and a bar above it. So our definition then for the arithmetic mean of a sample is the sum of all the values divided by the total number in the sample. Note our shortened sigma notation. This is really important that you know that x1 plus plus xn is represented by a summation sign or can be represented by a summation sign with an indicator variable i from 1 to n of the variables or the values xi. So please make sure that you're comfortable with this notation. We're going to do derivations tomorrow or the day after, and then you need to uh, handle this very easily. Also, one can use a more informal um, notation, just summation xi implying over all the x values. So that would be all in the sample of size n. Something else that I want to point out, because you're going to use it later on, is if you look at this relation, what do you get? If you take the n to the left-hand side, you also see that the sum of the x's is equal to n times the mean, n x bar. So remember that relation, we'll be using that again. I'm going to consider a number of examples to illustrate concepts like the sample mean and the sample median. But in the textbook, you have some examples that you can do on your own. So self-study is example 
on page 25, which illustrates the effect of an outlying observation on the sample mean. Also look at example 1.12 on your own on page 27. Here, the effect of a skew distribution on the mean is illustrated. And also example 1.13 on page 29 is something that you have to do on your own. Okay, let's just look at a practical example. In your textbooks, exercise 33. Here, we have a sample of 26 offshore oil workers who took part in a simulated escape exercise, resulting in the accompanying data on time per second to complete the escape. Now, we have similar kinds of data in South Africa. At Mossel Bay, we have such a plant. So this could have been South African data just as well. So these are seconds that it took them to escape. Now the first question is construct the stem and leaf display of the data. So that we learned last week or revised last week. So we, let's just have a look at that and see what's our general impression of this data set. The question is how does it suggest that the sample mean and median will compare? But we're not going to calculate the median yet. We'll just have a look at what we think the sample mean should be, more or less. So first of all, there's your stem and leaf display. Choosing three as a stem wouldn't work because all the values are between three to five and four to four. Here you have your maximum and there you have your minimum value. Choosing three and four as stems would result in two large branches, but rather we chose the smallest value as 320 and the largest as 420, and then we have the stem and leaf display. Note the units, hundreds and tens of the stem represent hundreds and tens digits, and the leaf represent one's digit. Okay. So if you look at the way that the values are distributed, it's more or less symmetrical. It's centered around 35, 36, 37. In other words, 3, 5, 6, up to 3, 7, 5, more or less. So it is round about, it, it's centered at 360 seconds. In minutes, that is divided by... 60, that yields about 6 minutes on average, we can guess. So the typical form is, it's centered more or less at 360 seconds. It's more or less symmetrical. We can expect the mean to be somewhere in the 360s. And let's calculate that mean. We said we use the symbol X bar. In this case, we have 26 observations. So we're going to look at the total. If we look at the original data set, it would mean 389 plus everything up to 397. Divided by 26. And that yields a mean value of 370.6923 and the shape as we said is more or less symmetrical so what do you guess is the median going to be is it going to be close to the sample mean or not we'll address that a little later on let's just look at the meaning of the mean in general as well in your textbooks, you have figure 1.13. Here you have a physical interpretation of X bar. X bar, or the mean, can be seen as a balance, balance point for a system of weights. So if you have a horizontal measurement axis, and each sample observation is represented by a one unit weight on the corresponding horizontal axis, the mean represents the point of balance. Now you can see there's an outline here, which is causes the mean to lie more to the right in this particular graph. But that means this is our point of balance. What will happen if there's no outlying value, if we didn't have that value? 
we'll get to that later on. Point is, mean is the balance point of a system of weights. If you see each point as a weight on a specific place on the horizontal axis. Now, just as X bar represents the average value of the observations in a sample, the average of all values in the population can also be calculated in principle. It's usually unknown, but in principle it can be calculated. And this average of the population is called the population mean and is denoted by the Greek letter mu. Please make sure that you write it down correctly. We say when there are n values in the population, a finite population, then mu is the sum of the n population values divided by the total number of values in the population. So, on the one hand, we have a sample of size n, and on that we can calculate the sample mean x bar. On the other hand, we have a population, and usually we want to estimate this population. The population, the size may even be unknown, but in general we're talking about the population size of capital letter N, and the population mean is indicated by mu. It's sort of a U, but with a long tail on the left-hand side. So what we'll be doing is, just as X bar is an interesting and important measure of a sample location, mu is an interesting and important, often the most important, characteristic of a population. So what we're going to do is, we're going to calculate a sample mean and use that to estimate a population mean. And in chapter 6, we'll be looking at how we can make, draw conclusions about the population mean based on a single sample with a certain confidence. We will be able to quantify how good our estimator is or our estimate is. Theoretically, of course, mu is 1 over n, if you have a finite population, sum i from 1 to n of xi. But that's usually unknown. The mean suffers from one deficiency that makes it an inappropriate measure of center under some circumstances. Its value can be greatly affected by the presence of even a single outlier. In other words, what's an outlier? An unusually large or small observation. Here's my picture again. If we, in this case, we have an unusually large outlier, um, uh, observation, which pulls the mean to the right. If that value is not there, the mean, the balance point is going to be to the left somewhere. So, the mean, we have that problem with the mean, but the sample mean remains the most widely used measure of center Largely, of course, there are many populations for which outliers are very scarce, and when sampling from such a population, a normal or a so called normal or a bell shaped distribution is the most important example, outliers are highly unlikely to enter the sample. So the sample mean will then tend to be stable and quite representative of the sample. However, if we have a problem, with outlying observations, we can use the so-called median. 
The median is synonymous with middle, and the sample median is indeed the middle value when the observations are ordered from smallest to largest. When the observations are denoted by x1 to xn, the symbol x tilde x tilde represents the sample median. The definition, the sample median is obtained by first ordering the n observations. From smallest to largest, with any repeated values included, so that every sample observation appears in the ordered list. And then, when we have odd, the sample size is an odd number, it is the single middle value. In other words, it's the one in position n plus 1 over 2 in the ordered um, set. Or, if n is even, it's the average of the two middle values. So let's look at an example returning to exercise 33. We've already calculated the values of the sample mean. And here it's given again that the sum of the x's is 9638. So we can quickly write down the sample mean again. x bar is then 9638 divided by 26. And that is equal to 370.7. 370.7 rounded. What is the median? For the median, we need to sort the data from smallest to largest. Here I've just put them next to one another. There's 26 observations. N is even. Therefore, we need to take the average of the two middle observations. So that's 369 and 370. And halfway between is 369.5. So there's our two values, the sample mean, the sample mean is 370.7 and the sample median is 369.5. They're quite close to one another, which was expected because we saw from the stem and leaf diagram that the, two, uh, that the distribution is more or less symmetrical. The last question we have here is the following. By how much could the largest time, currently 424, be increased without affecting the value of the sample median? By how much can we increase this for the median to remain the same? We can increase it to any value, because the middle values will remain the same. It would remain 369 and 370, and we take the average of those two values. So if it's increased, you can increase it to wherever you want to. But the second part of the question, by how much could this value be decreased without affecting the value of the sample median? The middle values remain the middle values until you decrease so that it is smaller than 370. So, if you decrease with 424 minus 370, that is 54 units, then you will change the median. So, without affecting the value of the sample median, you're not allowed to change it by more than 54. Because if it is lower than 370, the middle values are going to change and the sample median will be affected. Another aspect is um, illustrated in question D. What are the values of x bar and x tilde, the sample mean and sample median, when the observations are repre 
we re-expressed in minutes. To re-express in minutes, we need the relation that minutes the relation between minutes and seconds. So minutes is equal to seconds divided by 60. So that would just mean take the first value, 389, divided by 60, plus, 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 up to the last one, 397, divided by 60. That will give you the average time in minutes, and to divide that thing by the number of observations in your data set, and that's 26. And that gives you 6.18. Note that the mean in minutes, let's make it x bar in minutes, is equal to 6.18, which is the mean in seconds divided by 60. Again, note that your median, what happens to your median in minutes? The same value is going to be in the middle, so that would just mean it is your median in seconds divided by 60. And that is 6.16. You can go and check yourselves. Note that these two values, the mean as well as the median, are very close, which again agrees with our original um, stem and leaf display, which indicated that, that due to the symmetry, the mean and the median will be very close. Let's just look at this result in general. What do we observe here in terms of the sample mean. And that is given in general this result in exercise 39b. If each value is multiplied by a constant c, yielding yi is c times xi, xi, answer the question of part a, again verify your conjecture. conjectures. So in a they ask if a constant c is added to each in a sample, um, how do the sample mean and median relate to the mean and median of the xi's? So the yi's and the xi's, how do they relate? Let's just look at the second part here. And we say, okay, that means we work with y1 up to yn. y1 is c times x1 and yn is c times xn. So the mean of the y's is cx in CX1 plus 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 CXN and that is divided by the number in the sample which is N and that gives you you can take out the C as a common factor then you have the sum of the X's and you divide it by N so that is C times X bar. So in exercise 33, this C was equal to 1 over 16. Let's look at A. In this case, we have y1 up to yn, and now y1 is x1 plus c, and yn is xn plus c. y bar is, in other words, x1 plus c plus n terms of this kind, xn plus c, divided by the total number of terms, namely n. 
So what do we get here? We get the sum of all the x's plus n c's added together and we divide by n. So what does that give us? If you multiply every term by 1 over n, you get x bar plus uh, n c divided by n not by c, so it's x bar plus c. And if you, in exercise 33, if you let c be equal to minus 300, you can, and you have then that yi is xi minus 300, then you can easily calculate the means of the yi's, which will be small values, and in the end you can just add the 300. So you will get that y bar is x bar minus 300. Just go and check how that relates or um, works out in practice with the previous practical example. So what I want you to do is subtract 300 from every value, and here you get the new set of values. You can just get the mean for this set of values, and then find, see how it agrees with, with the original x bar. So you can always simplify your calculations by subtracting a constant throughout and then adding it again at the end. But write this out properly and see for yourself exactly how this result works. But in general, just as this x tilde is the middle value in a sample, the population median is the middle of the population and we indicate it by mu tilde. So, just as with the sample mean, which we're going to use to estimate the population mean, we're going to use the sample median to estimate the population median. In the next figure, we have examples of the relation between the population mean and the population median for different shapes of the distributions. So first of all, you can see when you have a symmetric distribution, the median would be the same as the population mean. Remember the population mean is just the average of all the values in the population. And the median is the middle value in the population. So you can see that here it would work out like that exactly. But in a negative skew distribution, in other words, you have values stretched out to the left, you will notice that your sample mean, your population mean, will also lie to the left of your population median. That is because your population mean is calculated on all values and it's pulled a little towards the end that has, um, to the end where you have a negative skew distribution. On the other hand, if you have a positive skew distribution, in other words, the tail on the right, more values on this end, it means your population mean is going to be pulled to the right and your population median will lie to the left of your population mean. So note these relations. This is all, always an indication of the shape of the distribution, the relation between the population mean and the population median. Similarly, for sample means and sample medians. The same will hold. Your sampling distribution would be negative skew if your sample mean is smaller than your sample median, and so on. The next thing that we'll be looking at is other measures of location, namely quartiles, percentiles, and trim means. Now, here I've included a figure that's not in your textbooks, 
but in words it is described in your textbooks and I will show you exactly where in your textbooks just now. It's at the bottom of page 29 at the top, uh, sorry, bottom of page 28 and top of page 29. It's just the situation where we say the median divides the data set into two equal parts. The so-called quartiles divides the, a data set into the order data set. Very important. Order data set is divided into two parts by the median, into four equal parts by the quartiles, and in 100 by the percentiles. We can also use the so-called deciles, which divides into 10, the data set into 10 equal parts. So half of the data will be smaller than the median, half larger. A quarter of the data will be smaller than the so-called first quartile, and three quarters will be larger than the first quarter. Similarly, three quarters will be smaller than the third quartile and one quarter will be larger than the third quartile. Also, percentiles, which are quite important in statistics, 10% is larger than the 90th percentile. 40% will be smaller than the 40th percentile. So let's just look at how these can help us in describing our data set. The sample mean and the sample median are influenced by outlying values in a very different manner. The mean greatly influenced by outlying values, and the median not at all. Since extreme behavior of either type might be undesirable, we briefly consider alternative measures that are neither as sensitive as X bar nor as insensitive as X tilde. So to motivate these alternatives, note that X bar and X tilde are at opposite extremes of the same family of measures. After the data set is ordered, the sample mean is computed by throwing away as many values on each end as one can without eliminating everything. In other words, leaving just one or two middle values and averaging um, what is left if you work with even number and you use two in the middle. On the other hand, if you calculate the sample mean, one throws away nothing before averaging. So we can say the mean involves trimming 0% from each end of the sample, whereas for the median, the maximum possible amount is trimmed from each end. And that yields a concept which we call a trimmed mean, which is a compromise between the sample mean and the sample median. So a 10% trimmed mean, for example, would be computed by eliminating the smallest 10% and the largest 10% of the sample, and then averaging what remains. In other words, back to my original graph, that means we're going to throw away the bottom part, the first decile or the lower 10% of data, and the upper decile of the or the upper 10% of the data and calculate the mean only on the middle 80% of what is left. And that will give us the so-called 10% trimmed mean. 10% trimmed at the bottom and 10% trimmed at the top. Before I show you an example, let's just look at it gen in general. Generally speaking, using a trimmed mean with a moderate trimming proportion, moderate is between 5% and 25% will yield a measure that is neither as sensitive to outliers as the mean, nor as insensitive as the median. 
For this reason, trend means have merited increasing attention from statisticians for both descriptive and inferential purposes, and we'll talk about that more in Chapter 7. But as a final point, if the trimming proportion is denoted by alpha and n times alpha is not an integer, then it's not obvious how the 100 alpha percent trimmed mean should be computed. For example, if alpha is 0.1, in other words, we want 10 percent and n is 22, then n times alpha is 2.2. And we cannot trim 2.2 observations from each n. So what do we do then? In this case, the 10% trimmed mean would be obtained by first trimming two observations from each n and calculating that trimmed mean, and then trimming three observations from each n and calculating that trimmed mean, and finally interpolating between the two values to obtain the final answer to the 10% trimmed mean. What I'm going to show you with an example. And the example that I'm going to use is exercise 30. Now, again, this example represents sale amounts for a sample of homes. Let's make it one, it's given uh, the values in terms of 1,000 of rand, and we pretend it's in some suburb of Pretoria that we have these sale amounts. So the, sale, the first question is A, calculate and interpret the sample mean and median. And secondly, suppose that the six observation had been 985 rather than 1285. How would the mean and median change? These two questions need to be answered on the video test that accompanies this video. So that you can test yourselves so whether you understand most of the concepts in this. So this you have to prepare and answer the questions on ClickUp. However, I want now to, to look at C. A 20% oops. A 20% trimmed mean. And then a 15% trimmed mean. Okay, first of all, 20% trimmed mean needs, means I need to drop 20% at the bottom and 20% at the top. Here I've sorted the data. So 20% of 10 is two observations. So I'm going to drop these two observations and I'm going to drop these two observations. And then I'm going to calculate the mean of the remaining 10 minus 4, 6 observations, and therefore my trimmed mean, 20% trimmed mean, is the sum of these values, 540 plus 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 up to 679 divided by 6, and that gives a value of 591.1667. If we need to get the 15% trimmed mean, 15% trimmed mean means we need to drop one and a half at each end. Now, we can't do that. So what we do is we get the 10% trimmed mean by dropping just the lowest and the largest, the minimum and the maximum. If you calculate that, you will see that that value is equal to 596.25. And then your 15% trimmed mean is 15 is halfway between 10 and 20. So it is the average of the two trimmed means, the 10% and the 15%, sorry, 20% trimmed mean. So that gives you half of 591.1667 plus 596.25. And that gives you 593.7083. I hope you will be able to calculate 
jumped means like this. Remember here it was easy to interpolate because it was exactly halfway between the two. If it's something else, we have to interpolate properly. Now as a last um, remark in this um, video is the calculation of categorical data as sample means for categorical data and sample proportions. Um, we are looking for numerical summary values and the frequencies in cat for categorical data are these numerical measures. But how does that relate to the sample mean? To do that, we're going to look at frequencies and relative frequencies, but how do we get to a sample mean? How does it relate to something like the sample mean if you have categorical data? In other words, you have something like success and failure. Let's say success is you pass and failure is you fail. And we have 10 students. We can dichotomize this data set in, and any categorical data can be dichotomized. We can look at a specific category and say if a something is present or absent, indicate it with a 1 or a 0. Success is one, failure is zero. Or it can be accommodation, you can be interested in residence or not residence. So it's one for residence, zero for any other type of accommodation. And then what is your mean? Your mean is the sum of all the ones. So divided by the total. So it's one over ten, the sum of the x's, but the x's now are zeros and ones. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven out of ten. And that is a proportion. That's a number. I'm using x now differently. The number out of n, the relative frequency. So in this case, x represents the frequency. On the left hand side, it represented observations of zeros and ones. But that's a relation between a sample mean and a sample proportion. So here you have a generalization of this result. If in a categorical data situation we focus attention on a particular category, and code the sample result so that a 1 is recorded for an individual in the category and a 0 for an individual not in the category, then the sample proportion of individuals in the category is the sample mean of the sequence of 1s and zeros. So, a sample mean can be used to summarize the results of a categorical sample. And the last example then is in exercise 38, and that I want to do on your own as well. A last thing, just as x over n is the relative frequency, frequency, p represents the population. And we're going to use the relative frequency x over n from a sample to infer about the population proportion p. Also, you can work with different proportions, relative frequencies in different categories, and so on. And these will be used to infer about corresponding proportions, P1 up to PK, for example. Your homework, ladies and gentlemen, is exercise 35. Note that... Um, the reported values are the values rounded to the nearest integer. So you need to round them. And exercise 30 A and B, which the questions will be based on as well, and exercise 37, which is based on exercise 25, is a proper exercise to see whether you understand all these concepts. Remember to answer the questions.